So today was Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference, also known as WWDC. This is a highly anticipated annual event where Apple makes a whole bunch of announcements about all the cool stuff that they've been working on. There was a lot of speculation that this year Apple would be talking about AI. There's also a lot of rumors that they'd be launching some sort of mixed reality headset. And there was also rumors that maybe Siri might get an AI upgrade. I'm pretty sure that Apple had some sort of PR meeting and decided that the term AI was a bad word because AI was not mentioned one single time during the entire presentation. However, there was quite a few mentions of machine learning and neural networks. In this video, I'm gonna break down some of the big announcements that Apple had today. And I'm not gonna avoid the word AI because they are baking AI into a lot of stuff that they're doing. And I'm also gonna spend quite a bit of time on the big announcement of the new Apple Vision Pro, the long rumored mixed reality headset that they did officially announce today albeit for $3,500 and not till next year, but they did announce it today and we will spend some time talking about this in a couple minutes. But before we do, let me break down some of the other eh, semi-notable things that came out of this event. Now the event itself lasted just a little bit over two hours. And if you want to see a super cut that I made of the entire event, where I cut the whole thing down to 18 minutes and 37 seconds with just the highlights, make sure you're following me over on Twitter, over at Mr. Eflow, and you can get the entire highlight reel there. So they started by breaking down the new 15 inch MacBook Air, which in my opinion seemed to get some marginal improvements. The new Air is 12 times faster than the fastest Intel-based MacBook Air, and it gets an astonishing 18 hours of battery life. It has an expansive display, the incredible performance of M2, a six speaker sound system, and tremendous battery life, all in the world's thinnest 15 inch laptop. They also introduced a brand new M2 Ultra chip. The M2 Ultra can support an enormous 192 gigabytes of unified memory, which is 50% more than M1 Ultra, enabling it to do things other chips just can't do. For example, in a single system, it can train massive ML workloads. Machine learning workloads. So they're basically saying that this can train your large language models. That the most powerful discrete GPU can't even process because it runs out of memory. So that's M2 Ultra. It's the most powerful chip ever created for a personal computer. They also made the announcement of iOS 17, which without ever saying the words AI, has quite a bit of AI features built into it. For example, if somebody calls you and leaves a voicemail, it will automatically transcribe the voicemail in real time. And if you're reading that voicemail and it seems like a call that you need to answer right now, you can actually pick up the call straight from that voicemail message. Another feature that I really like, if somebody sends you one of those audio messages, I'm somebody that doesn't really love the audio messages because I need to set aside the time to go and listen to the audio message and still they don't have any sort of speed up playback on the iPhones. It always frustrates me when somebody sends an audio message, just send it in a text, figure out how to condense it and send it in a text. But I'm getting off topic here. Apple is releasing a feature where if somebody sends you an audio message, it will transcribe it into a text for you so that you could just read the dang message. They've also improved the autocorrect in the messaging on the phone where it learns the words that you use more often. So if you try to send a message, it's no longer gonna say, just send the ducking thing. Autocorrect is powered by on-device machine learning. And over the years, we've continued to advance these models. Machine learning, not AI. The keyboard now leverages a transformer language model, which is state of the art for word prediction, making autocorrect more accurate than ever. Word prediction, where have I heard that before? Oh wait, that's what large language models seem to do. Sentence level autocorrections can fix more types of grammatical mistakes. And in those moments where you just wanna type a ducking word, well, well, the keyboard will learn it too. And predictions improve based on the phrases and words you use, so they're more personalized. And for the iPad background, they also use a machine learning model to synthesize additional frames. And when you select a live photo, we use an advanced machine learning model to synthesize additional frames to create a gorgeous, smooth, slow motion effect 
whenever you wake iPad. Now this is also pretty cool. When you're doing presentations, it uses machine learning to separate you from your background and give you these cool overlays on presentations. You could do things like this small overlay where it puts you in a little circle down on the bottom of the video, or they actually have this mode where it separates the background from you and then puts the presentation between you and the background. So it looks something like this. And there was some other marginal improvements around the iPad and the watch OS and the AirPods, but all of them just felt very incremental, very small compared to some of the bigger improvements we've seen over the years. And that was all of the main announcements during the main presentation. We do have one more thing. Introducing Apple Vision Pro. Until they got to the Apple Vision Pro. I wanna spend the rest of this video talking about the Apple Vision Pro because I was just at the Augmented World Expo last week and I am gonna make a video about my experience there, but I am one of the people that believes that augmented reality and mixed reality is where things are going. Yes, these things are very expensive. Yes, this is a $3,500 headset, but I don't think that this is the destination. This is just where we are right now. We have to remember that WWDC is the developers conference. These keynotes are tailored to developers. So they're showing off this technology with the idea that developers are gonna spend the $3,500 to buy these headsets and start developing on them. But over time, they're going to work as hard as they can to bring these price points down. Apple is not dumb. They do realize that $3,500 is very expensive for a consumer level toy, essentially. But the people that will spend the $3,500 are the early adopters, tech bloggers and YouTubers, and the developers who want to be building on the next gen platform. So that is something to keep in mind when we get to the price. I know there's gonna be a lot of hate in the comments. I already know there's a lot of people that are like, oh, screw Apple, I hate Apple. I'm somebody that plays both sides. I don't really care. I've got an Apple computer there. I've got a PC here. My phone is an iPhone. I've, I've got them all, I don't really care. But I already know that there's going to be some comments from people that either hate Apple or are gonna talk about how expensive this is. But I just wanna remind you that these presentations were designed to get developers excited about developing on the platform. It's also designed to create demand in the consumer and make people go, ooh, I want that, but that's a little pricey. And then in a year or two, when they release the Apple Vision Air for only $1,500, everybody rushes out to get it because they've been wanting it for so long. That's Apple's strategy. All right, so let's take a peek at this thing. So here's the scene where he goes and puts on the goggles and then enters right into this virtual world here. And you can see he still sees the environment around him, but now he's got this heads up display of all of his various apps. You just use your hands and your voice. That's it, there's no controllers. You're swiping around with your hands and you are speaking to it. And I think this is something that's really exciting to me is the idea that it can be used as a replacement to your monitor, right? Instead of having three monitors around you, you could essentially have apps in 360 degrees. So I have an app open here, an app open here, an app open here, an app open behind me and I spin around and I can use the app behind me. This idea of having a 360 sort of desktop monitor around me is exciting and the fact that I could drag apps around and move them and have my Slack conversations here and maybe be editing a video in front of me here, have Spotify playing music and my playlist open here so I could see what's next. That idea is I think one of the early use cases that's gonna get a lot of people excited. The other use case is for essentially having your own like movie theater in front of you. You can have the equivalent of watching like an IMAX movie on a hundred foot screen in front of you with Dolby surround, the best audio you've ever heard, spatial audio, and you can do it in a studio or apartment. Now, I saw a lot of people on Twitter going, okay, this is gonna replace my computer monitors, it's gonna replace my TV, it's gonna replace my surround sound, it's gonna replace all of these things, so the $3,500 price point is worth it. Personally, I don't totally agree with that. I'm married, I have two kids. For it to be able to replace my TV and my surround sound in my living room over there, I would need four of them because we watch movies together. We sit down as a family and we'll put on the latest Disney movie and sit around together and watch it with the surround sound. If I wanted that same experience with this, I'd need to own four headsets. By my math, that would cost me about $14,000 right now. So does it really replace your entertainment center? Eh, probably not yet. And because this is mixed reality, you can sort of go between being aware of the environment around you 
to going into pretty much full on virtual reality where the world around you disappears. So you could be watching a movie and put yourself outside next to a mountain like they're doing in this video. And if you're on an airplane, you can completely tune out everything that's going on around you and just fall into this own world that you created here. Now, one thing that I realized when I was at Augmented World Expo last week was that watching this stuff on video does not do it any justice. You cannot get a feel for what this experience actually feels like without trying it out yourself. One of the things that I found really cool about this Apple video was that you can have 3D objects in front of you and they will look real and you can spin them in 360 degrees. Now that is an experience that I got to try out at Augmented World Expo that when you watch a video like this and you see it on a 2D screen through YouTube, you just don't get the real feel of what it looks like in real life. But the idea that you can have a 3D object in front of you and you can kind of wave your hands around and spin it and look at it in different angles, it is pretty insane feeling when you try it out for the first time. Now, something else that they've added into this is the ability to have conversations through FaceTime. The people that you're talking to, they'll have a little more depth to them. The sound will be coming from the direction that they are actually on on the screen. So if somebody's like off to your right on your screen, you'll hear them a little louder to your right ear. If they're off to the left, a little bit louder in your left ear. It uses that spatial audio so you can know who's talking and look at the right person. You also have a digital avatar that looks like you when talking to somebody on FaceTime. And if the person you're talking to is also using a headset, you look 3D to them and they look 3D to you. This part right here with Disney was showing off some of the cool features that they're going to have inside of this headset really blew me away, especially since I'm a sports fan. I love watching baseball. I love watching basketball. Those are my two sports. And when I saw this demonstration of somebody watching a football game and then looking around and seeing the stats and seeing all this extra stuff on their heads up display or watching a basketball game and then looking down at a sort of virtual reality representation of the court and seeing the replay in that kind of angle, that was mind blowing to me. And remember this image that I showed you at the beginning? beginning of the video where you can actually see the person's eyes through the goggles, that's not actually their eyes. These goggles aren't clear. They're not seeing straight through them. Those eyes are superimposed on the front of the goggles. And that's designed so that if you're in this world wearing these goggles, the people around you know whether you can see them or not. If they can see your eyes, you can see them. If your eyes are in sort of a blurry, colorful haze, they know that you're in an immersive world and they can't see you right now. And the way those eyes are there and they actually look like you, your skin color, your eye color, they actually look like it is a continuation of your face. That's actually done using this like scanning process where you take the goggles and it looks at your face and it scans in your face and your eye color and your facial features and it figures out what you look like so that it can then superimpose it on the front. But then that's also the same graphic that people see when you have FaceTime conversations with them. All right, so I know so far it kind of sounds like I'm fanboying out about this. I do think it's really cool, but there are some downsides. There are some things that I'm kind of like, uh. The first one being that if you're gonna use it on battery, it only lasts two hours. And this is the battery pack. The battery pack isn't actually connected to the headset itself. It's connected via a cord that plugs into the headset and then you can put it into your pocket so that you don't have the extra weight of the battery on the headset. But even with the battery plugged in, you only get two hours. So let's say you wanna sit back and watch a movie that's two and a half hours. You don't have enough battery to do it. You need to be plugged into a wall. You need to be plugged into actual power in order to do that. Now, the other obvious big downside is that at $3,500, this isn't a mass adoption, mass market type thing. I can't see the majority of the world going out and dropping $3,500 to get their hands on one of these headsets. And like I mentioned earlier, if I wanna sit around and watch a movie with my family, I'd have to buy four of these headsets for all of us to have the same experience at the same time. That really doesn't make any sense at all. Now, if they were more like $1,000, maybe, maybe I would think about getting one for each family member so we can all have the same experience. But even that's getting pretty dang pricey to have four headsets in a house. But again, I do wanna reiterate that this is the developers conference. The people that are gonna spend the money on this are the early adopters, the tech bloggers, and the people that need them so that they can actually start developing on them so that when the price inevitably comes down on these things and it does get it to more of a consumer price point, they're already in the game. They've already been working on games. They've already been working on their apps. They've already developed on top of it. That's really where I feel this price point is geared
geared towards right now. So again, I'm not an Apple fanboy. I'm a tech fanboy. I don't really care the brand that's attached to the tech. I'll probably get some hate in the comments for saying that. It is what it is. I just love tech and I love nerding out about this kind of stuff. I love AI. I love augmented reality and virtual reality and extended reality and the whole gamut of realities, including real reality. That's why I bought a camper to go camping with my family more often so we can get into the real reality more often. But overall, I think Apple did a good job today of getting people excited about the idea of these goggles, the idea that maybe we have a monitorless future where we put on these goggles and all we have is a keyboard and mouse in front of us and we can get our work done on these virtual monitors. Maybe we have a future where gaming is more in this virtual world on a hundred foot screen. Maybe the future of us watching movies and IMAX and 3D movies like the new Avatar movie, maybe that is more geared towards headsets. Maybe this is the future of where it's going. Going. I think Apple does a good job of selling that potential vision, even though they're not making it accessible to everybody right now, they're showing people where things can go, and I know it's their goal to make it more accessible. Things like the Oculus Quest you can get for 500 bucks right now. You've got AR glasses like the X-Real glasses, which you can get for under 400 bucks right now. None of them have the level of tech that this has in it, the level of processing power, the level of visual effects, but I think products like this being put out by Apple are going to start to get people excited about this technology and bring it to the forefront, bring it mainstream, get more people talking about it. And I bet we see a spike in sales from companies like Oculus, from companies like Xreal. We'll see. I'm here for it. I love all this tech stuff. I'm gonna keep nerding out. Again, if you wanna see my super cut of this, I put it up on Twitter, it's 18 minutes. It's a TLDV of the entire two hour presentation broken down into 18 and a half minutes. I also have another tweet up here that breaks down what the Apple Vision Pro is, some of the specs, it's 23 million pixels, which is better than 4K per eye. It uses spatial audio by analyzing the room around you. It's powered by two different chips, the Apple M2 chip and a brand new chip called the R1. And it's got a brand new Apple operating system called called Vision OS. So if you wanna see this breakdown, again, I shared this over on my Twitter. You can find it over at Mr. Eflow or just search out Matt Wolf. And that's sort of my breakdown slash thoughts and opinions on Apple's new headset that they just announced today. Hopefully you find it helpful. If you love nerding out with me about this kind of stuff, follow me over on Twitter, Mr. Eflow. I'm sharing tweets every single day. A lot of times it's in real time. Check out futuretools.io where I share all the cool tools and news that I come across and join the free newsletter. I send a newsletter every single Friday Friday with a handful of cool AI tools that I came across, all the latest news that's worth hearing about, a few YouTube videos, and one cool way to make money with AI. It's the TLDR of AI, and now a little bit of XR every single Friday. Just go to futuretools.io and join the free newsletter. Now, if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. I'll make sure you keep on seeing cool videos about future tech like AI and XR inside of your YouTube feed. And if you enjoyed this video particularly, give it a thumbs up and that'll make sure you see more videos just like it in your feed. Thanks so much for tuning in. Really appreciate you. See you guys in the next video. Bye-bye. <laughs>